don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the stream. Today is Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 508 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Osier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Chris Young, Semphilis, James McQuiggan from 35,000 feet in seat B2 or B1, Marcus Kyler with the Yeats. Gary Sturgiotis showing up on a hot Tuesday. Sid Pat, not only IT, Scotty Scott, Toasty Pops, my man Emilio Garcia, everyone with the kids, everyone in a group meeting, Johnny Five, Ellery Doro, Matthew Necci, and Thomas Marquette, all those on LinkedIn, all those on YouTube. Guess what, y'all? We're all going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis along with you in chat on how these stories matter. How can we use them to drive cyber risk reduction? What is the sailing uh, point uh, to distill out of the story and implement operationally? And if you're looking to break into the industry, believe me, you've got value here because you're gonna get exposed to terminology, concepts, threat actor names, what you're gonna have your finger on the pulse of the industry. And believe me, you will be asked at any single cybersecurity job interview, hey, Answer me this question. How do you stay current on the industry? This answer is a slam dunk. Chuck in the house with a super chat. We just become best friends. Yep. Thank you, Jerry, Jenny, Chris, Kimberly, Johnny Five, David, Matt, Eddie, Angel, uh, excuse me, Angie, Samari, whoops, Dream, Mr. Green, and anyone I miss for the love and support. We just become best friends. Yep. Thank you so much for the super chat, Chuck, and great to have you uh, as a contributing member of the Simply Cyber community. Absolutely uh, love love having you here and uh, also love what can only be uh, definitely a Chevy Chase profile photo, but I'm going to go ahead and lean into saying that's from Fletch, if I may. If I may, uh, let me know if that's from Fletch. Great, great classic comedy that got buried um, in the uh, late 80s, uh, but it's a good one. Go, d dig into the crates, if you will, and pull out Fletch, I think you'll find it uh, really enjoyable. All right, guys, <clears throat> let me tell you this. We're gonna be shredding all the top cyber news of the day, but guess what, before we get into that, allow me to tell you about the stream sponsors, my friends, the ones who enabled me to effectively do this every single day, 508 days in a row and counting, Starting with my good friend Eric Taylor of Barricade Cyber. More about Barricade at the mid-roll as they are the featured sponsor right now. But dude, check it out. Panopsi Security, if you don't know about them, if you're operating left of boom, needs a little bit of improvement, then consider Panopsi. Get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals. Panopsi Security can come in as a fractional VC. So, and if you need help like straightening out your information security program. If you're totally reactive and you need help, they can help. If you're trying to decide on how to spend money, like listen, the CIO, the CEO is like, holy crap, we just had a ransomware incident in 2023. Here's a blank check, Jerry. Go for it. Tell me what you need. And you're like, I don't know what I need. Consider Panopsi Security. They are a trusted partner who can help you. I love Panopsi enough that um, I'm a board a advisory board member of the company. Uh, because I believe in them. Uh, so anyways, check it out, panopsi.com. Uh, giddy up on that. Also, really quick, if you need tabletop exercises, which I strongly encourage you 
uh, check out if you, especially if you're manufacturing or healthcare. Panopsi has that in their arsenal as well. Want to say shout out and love to Anti Siphon Training. Guys, Anti Siphon Training is disrupting the traditional cybersecurity training industry by providing high quality, cutting edge education to everyone, regardless of their financial position. If you didn't know, the Snake Oil Summit is starting tomorrow, December 6th at 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. There's still time to get on it. Use the link in the description below to get to Anti Siphon Training. I'll also drop it in chat. If you're watching on replay, go check it out, guys. This is another free conference that's just absolutely dope. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and click in here. Oh, this is for the training. They have training as well, obviously. But uh, go check out Snake Oil Summit. Boom, right there. Panel discussion, Jake Williams, John Strand, Ralph May. We got Graham Helton, more John Strand, Sean Goodwin, Matt Marks, Hudson Bush, Blake Reagan. Dude, this is sick. Again, here's another car. If you enjoyed Simply CyberCon, but, uh, buckle up, Buttercup, because here's another like dope, free, in-your-face remote conference. Get on it. Love myself some Anti-Siphon. Thank you so much, Anti-Siphon, for the continued support. Listen, guys, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat, Brief Threat Briefing is worth one half a CPE. So be sure to say what's up in chat. Grab a screenshot. Throw it in a file. Uh, excuse me. Grab it in a folder. Oh, hey, Ray Sear, first time on live, usually a, a hashtag team replay. You know what, Ray? I'm checking with the judges. We're going to count it. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Listen, say what's up. Team live, hashtag team live. If you're in chat right now, love myself some team live. If you're on replay, team replay. But if it's your first episode of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, maybe you heard it from a friend. Maybe you found it through Advent of Cyber. Whatever. If today's your first day, welcome to the party, pal. Make the circle wider for our new friends and say hashtag first timer in chat. We love welcoming newcomers, making them feel warm and special. We've got a special sound effect for you. We've got special emotes for you. So drop a hashtag first timer in chat. Before we get into the news, let me just tell you all the stories that we're about to go through. I do not research, research nor do I prepare. I know that sounds ridiculous, but listen, I don't even know what stories are about to come up. This is me shooting, you know, straight from the hip. I'm riding low on the hip on a train bound for glory. Choo choo, giddy up on it. And that's how we roll. 508 episodes. That's the format of the show. We're all in here together having a good time. I'm a practitioner. Let's go. All right. We got mod chat up. We got, it's Tuesday. So we've got tidbits Tuesday coming up where I share a little bit about myself. Uh, maybe resonate with you all. We got Mark Johnson Stanley. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal, Mark Johnson Stanley. Let's get that emote train going. Where, come on. Oh, I can't get to that emote. There it is. There it is. McLean. Alex Goodwin. Not shooting my mouth off, foghorn, leghorn style. Oh, yeah, I'm jaw jacking to the moon. All right, guys, do me a favor. Sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news. Wash over us in an awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. Mitch, Mr. Struffolino, Mr. Struffolino. Rich Struffolino. UK nuclear site attacked by state-linked actors. The Guardian reports <laughs> that threat actors linked to Russia and China breached the UK's Sellafield nuclear site. Sellafield holds the largest store of plutonium on Earth and serves as a large-scale disposal site for nuclear waste. Sources say authorities do not have an exact date of compromise, but initially detected breaches as far back as 2015. No word of malware still remains on the site's systems, but sources say it's likely the attackers already accessed its most sensitive data. The Guardian learned the UK's <laughs> Office of Nuclear Regulation, or ONR, placed the site under special measures <laughs> last year for cybersecurity failings. The regulator only learned of the issues after staff at an external site reported they could access Sellafield servers. What the heck, dude? This is crazy, man. Uh, so, first of all, first of all, you know, like, let's not be, let's not be naive, okay? Nuclear power, there is waste that is made from it, and you got to do something with it. I know a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with this because it's just human nature, but a lot of people are like, 
yeah, no, 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 nuclear energy, nuclear, whatever, everything's good. Just, you know, we got to get rid of the waste, just not in my backyard. Oh, that's a problem. We should do something about that, but not in my backyard. Uh, it has to go somewhere. So this Sellafield place sounds like, um, as they put in the comments, a bottomless pit of hell, money and despair. That sounds pretty bad. Um, now, here's the thing. Like, okay, whatever. You got a nuclear cleanup site. It's like anything else, dude. If you're gonna if you're gonna put a project in place, you've got to account for all aspects of the project, including you know the output and what you're gonna do with it, decommissioning, all that stuff. So, uh, what's weird is the officials at this place have been hiding that it's being hacked in since 2015, which is this is the part that's like almost unbelievable. That is eight years ago, guys. In, in, in 2023, I feel like, you know, getting hacked, you know, it's, it's not, it's not nearly as, um, I mean, it's, it's bad, right. But from a public image, from the way that, uh, governments respond from the way that individuals are, are drug up and treated as, um, you know, kind of, uh, sacrifices in order to like be the face of whatever the problem is that's gone away. Like, and just to give you an example, go look at the OPM breach, Oscar Papa Mike, the OPM breach, and the director of OPM, Catherine Archuleta. Like, when OPM got breached, Catherine Archuleta, who was definitely not an IT person, uh, was the director of the agency. She got brought in front of Congress. She got, like, verbally eviscerated and then fired. And and usually, back in the day, they would want some face and name to pin all the blame on. So, you know, people in the public could feel good, like, oh yeah, we got that problem. So for this, for this to happen, it's just crazy. I don't know if these people uh, were like, oh, we, we just kind of like let it go. And, and so I, first of all, I'm surprised that there isn't a name associated with whoever the senior officials are at this place that have been covering it up. Second of all, dude, a, a plutonium waste plant that sounds pretty awful as far as like if you could get in there and dink around with the um, like Stuxnet kind of like dink around with the, uh, the the safety controls. If you could melt that place down or get it, get a, a leakage out, you could cause significant damage um, to at least the UK, if not Europe in the larger sense. Um, I do want to say that like, this is so bad as far as like a, uh, and if, there, hold on, if there's anyone in chat who's like military that worked with like nuclear power and plutonium, please chime in. But my thing is like, this is one of those like, yeah, okay, uh, Russia could or China could like cause a leak and stuff. But dude, you're messing with like the planet at that point, like a, a, a radioactive waste, you know, you could be screwing up your own plants and your own things. So from a self-preservation perspective, I don't know how good a deal that is. I, to me, like the bigger story here is that they've been covering up the breaches since 2015, um, you know? This thing's been in... Holy crap, dude. This plant's been in place for more than 70 years. This was like one of the OG Cold War nuclear weapon uh, radioactive waste plants. Ooh, ooh, ooh. that's not good. Um, all right. So the TLDR here is, um, honestly, you would hope with, uh, with this amount of like focus and stuff coming on that they've been implementing better cybersecurity controls in place. This is an OT industrial control system. You know, you would hope that OT and IT would be separated. If you work in energy, if you work in basically energy, right? Whether it's nuclear or electrical or wind or whatever, the OT, the things that cause a uh, uh, control cyber physical systems uh, should be separated as best you can from the IT systems. That way, when there is a compromise, it doesn't get into the OT, like the plant keeps operating. This place is 70 years old. So there's a lot of deprecated um, infrastructure in place. Again, you'd hope that they've been upgrading it over time. Being hacked since 2015, I'm stunned that they were able to keep it quiet this long. Alex Goodwin wants me to put in my hat for the new CISO role over at Sellafield. Yeah, I don't know about that. That's uh, That might be one where uh, you're not sleeping well at night, but hey, you know what? If the budget's right, I'll, 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 uh, I'll take a run at it. Um, 
As long as I can work remotely, with all due respect, I don't think I want to go into the office at a radioactive waste plant that's had breaches since 2015 by a motivated, sophisticated uh, adversary <laughs> that's driving the BRICS train. All right, let's keep going. And anyways, there's nothing like to me. I, I guess my final thoughts on this. Technically speaking, this isn't good, but I'm interested to see what happens from government to the senior officials who have been covering this up since 2015. That's not okay. You can't just bury things like this when there's national security and general population human safety concerns at place. You can't hide. You can't bury this stuff. That's not legal as far as I'm concerned. U.S. confirms Iranian actors behind water breaches. Finally. In a joint advisory, CISA, the FBI, NSA, EPA, and Israel National Cyber Directorate confirmed that a hacking persona of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, known as Cyber Avengers, orchestrated attacks on Unitronics programmable logic controllers used at water utilities and other infrastructure. The attacks targeted these systems with default credentials starting on November 22nd. We previously reported on attacks by the group on water utilities in Pennsylvania. The UK's National Cybersecurity Center said some of its domestic infrastructure may be at risk of similar attacks, but characterized the impact as minimal. All right. First of all, first of all, two things. One, Larry Ogunbanjo uh, said, first time here from London. So, Larry... Welcome to the party, pal. Let's give Larry a little uh, uh, John McClain love. Welcome to the party, pal. We'll give you a little shout out there, Larry. Uh, and is Anti-Siphon Snake Oil Summit eligible for CPEs? Absolutely. Absolutely eligible for CPEs. Any cybersecurity conference is going to be eligible for CPEs. So get up on that, Larry. Second of all, U.S. confirms Iranian attacks on water companies. We have been covering water attack water company attacks for days and i remember I, like if you were a regular of the show you know i was like what the hell what sorry kennedy i was like what the heck is going on with all this water attacks like it's like up in the spot um there was pennsylvania there was uh, like north dallas um but apparently dallas is so big that it has uh different uh geographical elements but there's been several um now here's the thing U.S. confirms Iranian attacks. So now it makes it sound like, yes, the threat actor group Cyber Avengers is being attributed to Iran. I feel like when you say U.S. confirms Iranian attacks, you're, you're, you're making it like a nation state level, sophisticated threat actor, geopolitical APTs, you know, move over sandworm, Cyber Avengers is in the house. And in reality, that's not... The case, like yes, they're Iranian born. They might, you know, be in Iran talking or whatever. But dude, these guys are exploiting default credentials. <gasps> Come on, bro. Like my son is eleven. He could exploit default credentials, and I'm not taking anything away from my son. I'm just saying, you like the. Dude, there's like literally a question in our industry. It's it's a it's a common question in our industry. Is is using default creds on a network device considered hacking? Like that's a legit question and one that people fight about uh honestly. And I'll I'll throw the question to you. I'm going to run a poll right now. Also, uh Raphael John first time or welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Let's do this. I just want to show you how polarizing this is is uh, breaking, is exploiting default creds hacking. Like start a poll. Like it's a, it's a real question. <clears throat> is exploiting default creds considered hacking? Yes or no? My point is like they're, they're portraying it. And, and honestly, I feel like not to say that this is spin, but Iran is kind of part of the BRICS, which is like anti-Western philosophies and government. There's like, you know, China and Russia are doing things to the United States and the UK. We just covered a story about how Russia broke into the UK nuclear waste plant. So there are these things, but I feel like part of this is the spin that like, oh, Iran is hacking us, right? But these guys are like not much more sophisticated than, you know, I don't want to say script kiddies, uh, but it, it, they're not much more sophisticated than like, you know, 
your first week as a pen tester, like scan for systems, try default creds, right? Me, right, botnet. Now, now let's turn the, um, in, India is bricks, Alex Goodwin. India is bricks. I think um, India is bricks, but you can see here, um, like Iran's going to join the BRICS alliance. I know you can't really see that, but Iran's going to join the BRICS alliance, uh, Alex, a whole bunch of them. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi, UAE, they're, they're all joining BRICS in the next like uh, two months here. Uh, but I digress. The TLDR here is don't have freaking default credentials on your network, bro. Like there's an uptick in activity uh, in threat actors exploiting water treatment plants. Here's an idea. Don't have default creds. But by the way, like just for a hot minute, you have default creds on internet facing assets. That's literally the dumbest thing. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Like, but like, there's no multi-factor authentication, obviously, because they would have stopped them. So you literally have internet-facing default cred, no multi-factor, into an into a critical infrastructure environment. What in the hell? Sorry, Kennedy, but this one is warranted. What in the hell are you thinking? Um, Justin Gold is our our resident water treatment uh engineer. Justin, what? I'm not throwing this all on you, but what are we doing here? Like when we talk, I'm sorry to digress like fully and just go nuclear here. But listen, we're talking about like, oh, next gen firewall, continuous threat exposure management. We've got all these whistles. AI, how's it going to revolutionize? Check out the SIM. Woo! And dude, you're running default creds to the internet. Like, Stop. You don't get to do the cool next gen stuff until you do the fundamentals, right? You can't have a fancy scripted, you know, um, loop de loop uh, play with like, you know, a flea flicker. You can't do a cool little silly football play where the running back throws it back to the quarterback and the quarterback throws it to a lineman or something until your offensive line can block. You need fundamentals before like you're building a house on quicksand my man you need fundamentals and changing default creds does not require an advanced degree you just need to do it as part of your standard implementation of technology jesus christ and on top of that you can scan for these things you should have found them the fact that this is what cyber avengers is finding is 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 brutal it is brutal it's like that meme where the, the guy like has got the gun and he like shoots himself in a leg. Like, what are you doing? You, you're trying to, you're supposed to be helping the problem. You are literally um, aggravating and driving the problem. Oh my God. Fassy. Also really quickly on the poll, we're, we're kind of divided. Two thirds of you believe that default creds is hacking. One third, no. The infinite regress of chat GPT data exfiltration. Researchers at DeepMind published a paper detailing that asking chat GPT to repeat a specific word forever can cause it to reveal training data sets. The researchers found when making this request to chat GPT 3.5, it would start repeating the word before hitting some sort of limit and then outputting other data. The researchers extracted several megabytes worth of data, including some PII. Jason Kobler of 404 Media notes that now similar requests warn that this may violate OpenAI's content policy or terms of use. OpenAI did not comment on the findings. All right. Uh, hey, really quick, just getting uh, just getting a little check in here from our resident engineer. Operational technology at smaller orgs is handled by operations, which would not be IT. Uh, there usually isn't an IT department at those places anyway. So if it gets stood up and then everyone's scared to break it, so changes are minimal until something bad happens. All right. So that's the deal. They deploy the technology. The packets are flowing. Thumbs up. That needs to change. That is a fundamental flaw in the approach. And this, this right here is going to continue to happen until otherwise. Military Cyber oh, yeah. Advocacy Group names its first president. Get out of here. I didn't get to comment on this story. Um, all right. Shall we play a game? So I love, um, 
I love offensive security professionals. I love the way they think. I love how out of the box and innovative they are. Here's another prompt hacking thing. Repeat a word forever. Eventually it, it reaches some limit and then starts puking out other information. Remember, ChatGPT can give you a recipe for great ribs or give you a um, you know, give you an affirmation of your skills. But at the end of the day, it's just a piece of software, and software has vulnerabilities and can be exploited. I would imagine that this particular hack is immediately going to be deployed into Bard and all the other AI, you know, chat GPT clones uh, until they violate terms of service. This uh, news article said that it would start revealing PII. Final thing I'll say, guys, and you should be uh, implementing this not just in policy at your organization, but really um, in, in your end user awareness training. Uh, and, and two things about that. First of all, as far as end user awareness training goes, you should tell your IT staff, your, your staff, your end users, whoever, tell your family at Christmas dinner, or your holiday dinner, anything you stick in there, I don't care if you pay for chat GPT or not. Anything you stick in there, you no longer own. Okay. Period. Full stop. You stick something in there, it's off. So you put your own PII in there. It, good luck. You have no assurances that that data is secured in any way. You have no retaliation. You could put in your, your, your driver's license information, then it immediately gets dumped uh, to somebody else who asked a question about like, show me a driver's license for the state of South Carolina, right? And you, what are you going to do? You are not in the control of the data once you disclose it. So be mindful. This is a super powerful tool, but it, from a data security perspective, you have zero assurances on how it's going to be protected. Now, obviously this is a multi-billion dollar enterprise. So they want to um, not be ridiculous with their data security standards. But I'm telling you, um, it's basically like sending email or something. Like once you once it's out there, it's out there. Also tell your young, uh, your young users out there. I feel like kids make boneheaded decisions that could come back to haunt them. So mind that. Also really quickly, and I know we're getting up on the time here. I was at a holiday cookie decorating party the other day because that's, you know, that's what I do. And um, I was talking to people, a lot of people outside our world don't really know what AI is. Honestly, like I thought AI was like mainstream and everyone's talking about it. I talked to a registered nurse. They had no idea. I talked to a professional chef. He had no idea. I talked to people and they're like, no, like I've heard people talking about AI a little bit, but I don't know what it is. And I whipped out my app. And I showed them, uh, I was like, give me, a, give me like a really complex medical question and use acronyms and all this other crap. And she gave it to me and I threw it up and I was like, what would, what would you do, Dr. ChatGPT? And it gave like a full treatment plan. She's like, oh my God. So people aren't really like, it's, we're in a bubble of AI right now. It's crazy. The Military Cyber Professionals Association or MCPA named Chris Cleary into the role. The MCPA began operations in 2013. Until now, a board of advisors ran the organization. Cleary previously served as the Navy's first principal cyber advisor. Cleary hopes to build up the collective memory within the military cyber world, identifying it as unique in the space of warfighting domains for a lack of long-term institutional knowledge. Cleary also sees the group calling for more cyber advocacy on Capitol Hill. All right. Uh, I love this. Graybeards. Hey, shout out to the Graybeards. Which, by the way, just to point out, this is uh, somewhat uh, exclusive, right? Because <clears throat> Graybeards would indicate men, typically, I would imagine. So uh, we might see this term. I say gray hairs, uh, just to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, this organization is going to have 4,000 members. It looks like it's... Uh, it's got some real big swingers here. Former heads of U.S. Cyber Command, NSA, uh, elite uh, senior intelligence veterans up in here. So I don't know what their mission is, though. I think, what what is this? What's their mission? All right. I don't understand what their mission is necessarily, but... Um, This organization's been around for 10 years, so I don't know why they're, it's in the news today. 
Uh, I guess they elected their first president. The idea is um, the idea is that they're using this group in order to retain knowledge, share knowledge. Uh, it's good. Uh, if you're former military, I know Chris Young, Marine, Eric Taylor, Marine, uh, Chuck Sapp, Marine, um, Jessica Hyde, Marine. I, you, you may notice a pattern. I kind of like uh, gravitate towards the Marines. Um, you might want to check this out. Military Cyber Advocacy Group. Um, I, I'd like to know more about this. I don't know what they do. I don't know if this is they're a community service for the U.S. government or if they help each other kind of like get into industry. But hey, I'll tell you this. Um, for people looking to break in, if you're former military, this sounds like an amazing networking opportunity. Networking, <clears throat> you're more likely to get a job through networking than through a apply button on LinkedIn. I'm just saying that. So <clears throat> you may want to check this out. It looks like you can get more information here at the uh, millcyber.org. I'm going to drop a link in chat. If anybody has information on this, let me know. I don't know much more about it other than what I just said. So good luck. Also, um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll do two tidbits Tuesday. We're at the mid-roll. And now a word from our sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Facing a ransomware attack? Don't panic. Remain calm and remain. Carry, check out that Barricade check out that Cyber group Solutions, then. The DFIR team trusted to quickly recover business data with exclusive ransomware recovery services for small and medium businesses alike. Recover from ransomware and get your business back online with Barricade Cyber Solutions. Visit recoverfromransomware.com to schedule a call with the team today. That's recoverfromransomware.com. All right, everybody, it's the mid-roll. All right, everybody, welcome to the mid-roll. Thank you so much for being here. We are averaging about 450 of you beautiful people here every single morning. Thank you so much for being here. Guys, if you're getting value from the stream, do me a solid. Hit that like button on YouTube. Not because it pumps my stats and I, I, I get, you know... I get value of my self-worth from it. It literally helps other people find the stream. If today's your first day on the Simply Cyber, uh, Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, right? Perhaps you're Larry Hogan Banjo. Perhaps you're another one of the uh, amazing people who it's your first time. You may have found it because yesterday people hit the like button. So do your part, hit the like button, pay it forward, okay? Also, uh, shout out to the stream sponsors, Barricade, Panopsite, and Anti-Siphon. Really appreciate the continued support. Hey, guys. So check it out. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Thomas Marquette is currently holding the baton. So if Thomas can tag somebody, we would love it. Listen, if you would like to supercharge your LinkedIn feed and build your professional network, Jake Woolley, Welcome to the party, pal. If you want to, hey Jake, if you want to build your professional network like a boss on LinkedIn, check it out. Go on LinkedIn, search for this hashtag. Anybody can do it. Go on LinkedIn, search for this hashtag. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Once you find it, there's Thomas Marquette. It posted yesterday. He holds the baton. Connect with Thomas. Then comment on Thomas's post. Connect with the people's in comments. Five minutes a day, two weeks time, other people are gonna connect with you passively because you're in the comments. Five minutes a day for two weeks, I promise you your LinkedIn feed's gonna turn into an amazing, amazing feed. Ask anyone else in chat. Shout out to James McQuiggan with the uh, squad memberships. We've got 20 squads. Thank you so much, James McQuiggan. Coming to you from 35,000 feet. That's right, Priceless Pancake posted uh, two months ago and it's still getting new requests. I'm telling you, this is a force multiplier. Do it or don't do it, but invest in yourself. You have to take the initiative. Two weeks, five minutes a day, okay? That's it. All right, guys, every single day of the week has a special segment. Today is Tidbits Tuesday where I spare... I share a little bit about myself. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell a funny story, okay? I was going to tell you a holiday thing, and I'll tell you a, 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 after the show ends if that's okay. 
But let me just tell you this. This story right here um, mentions this right here. BZ, Bravo Zulu, okay? I want to tell you a funny story about this. So in the military, Bravo Zulu is, um, it basically means like good job, okay? Like good job, nice job, kudos. You did great work, okay? So like if, if I'm working and someone um, on my team goes above and beyond, Glum Hippo, 413, payload too large, yes. All right, hey, so Bravo Zulu is like, good job, it's an attaboy, it's a good on you, right? I didn't know that. I worked at the Pentagon, okay? I worked at the Pentagon in my first month at the Pentagon, I was probably like 23, 24. My first week at the Pentagon, I wanted to get like merch. I wanted to get a Pentagon um, uh, mug, right? A coffee mug, right? So I could so I could drink every day with a cool coffee mug from the Pentagon and you know, whatever. People come over, they're like, oh, the Pentagon. I'm like, yeah, I work there. So there was a Bravo Zulu mug and I thought it looked really cool. So I bought that. So I was walking around with a Bravo Zulu mug. Here's the thing. You're not supposed to buy yourself Bravo Zulu merch. It's supposed to be given to you for good work. And I basically bought a t-shirt that said like employee of the month. I had no idea. Someone eventually came to me and they're like, oh, what'd you win that for? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I, I, I bought this. They're like, ooh, like that's a bad look, dude. And I'm like, oh my God. So be careful out there. But yes, yeah, so, so I, 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 I awarded myself a Bravo Zulu award for not doing anything. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's my tidbits Tuesday. Um, really quick. Uh, some of the chats came in here. Uh, Chris Young, uh, with the super chat. We just become best friends. Yep. Thanks so much. Chris Young. Also, we saw a uh, glum hippo with the, uh, four, one, three payload too large, uh, HTTP server code request. I like it. We just become best friends. Yep. Also, I want to shout out Lintil Lintil with the first timer. What's up, Lynn Till? Good to see you. Welcome to the party, pal. Thank you all so much. All right. Uh, Thomas Marquette's going to tag somebody with the baton, and let's keep going. EU reaches agreement on Cyber Resilience Act. On December 3rd, the European Parliament and EU Council reached an agreement on the Cyber Resilience Act. The EU Commission first proposed the CRA back in September 2022. The law impacts connected devices across sectors, requiring mandatory security bug reporting and at least five years of security updates. While still requiring a formal approval process, the CRA is now set to become law. Once entered into the EU's official journal, manufacturers will need to meet requirements within 36 months. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Woo! All right, hold on. Two things, and I, I don't know if you guys picked up on this one, right? Again, I don't see these before they come out. Um, like, cue up the baby oil. This is pants-off level news right here. Parliament in the UK or the EU reaches agreement on Cyber Resilience Act. Two things. First of all, uh, just a slow golf clap for cyber resilience. I am like firmly on this train. I have not been trying to get anybody on this boat. But dude, it's not cybersecurity. I get that that's the term and that's it's going to take uh, a massive shift to rebrand our industry from cybersecurity. But dudes, it's cyber resiliency. We're not secure in anything. All we're doing is trying to limit the impact of when crap gets taken down. That's resiliency. We're trying to keep things operational while we're suffering um, attacks and, and you know whatever, right? That like the sub takes on water. We we compartmentalize the water and keep on the mission. We are resilient. We're not. Okay, so I've been firmly on this train for a while, right? Cybersecurity is spelt cyber resiliency. So first of all, way to go, uh, my EU brethren. Pip, pip, cheerio and all that. Second of all, there was a story in yesterday's news that I like went off on a tangent about. So if, if you didn't, if this is your first time, Lynn Till, maybe you want to go watch yesterday's stream. But check it out. The um, CISA, the... Um, um, oh my God, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency for the United States, right? The one that defends America. Uh, this guy named Goldstein, who's like a high up at CISA said in yesterday's news that um, we need to stop doing uh, patching 
and we need to get in front of securing by default. And I lost my mind that vendors have a perverse incentive to not do that. Financially, it makes sense to get to market. Uh, financially, it makes sense to make things less secure because they're more usable. Uh, again, me and Josh, Josh Mason have to have an online debate in front of you guys about how I believe that usability and security is a slider. Okay. And there are a couple things like federated authentication benefits everybody. But anyways, so this right here, this right here is the European Union pushing legislation that will require private sector tech companies to implement security by default or get in trouble. This is how you do it. They are saying, like, for example, you will need to make default credentials changed before you're allowed to push into production. Okay. Like as an example, you will require multi-factor authentication. You will not be able to disable it. Right. For example, right. You will set auto patching and it'll have to be disabled. You know, so they're, this is what they're saying. They're saying they're making the big tech companies do it, which is what Goldstein was saying yesterday. EU, you got it, boy. I love it. I love it. I love it. By the way, quick little fun fact, this stupid Iranian um, default creds walking in, uh, right? That's not going to happen in the EU. Now, I'm being very, very hyperbolic because this isn't going to affect old technology that's been in place since the 80s, right? This is for new tech coming out. But I love this. Get the shirts made. I'm on board with the Cyber Resilience Act. If they need me to sign anything or promote it on social media, call me. I'm, I'm ready. All right. Let's go. 23andMe data leak expands. Back in October, the genetic testing company announced it experienced a data breach. Late last week, it said threat actors accessed personal data on 0.1% of users. That's about 14,000 individuals. This disclosure also mentioned that accessing those accounts exposed a significant number of profiled data with other users' ancestry. Now, the company has said the exposure impacted 6.9 million people. This includes 5.5 million who opted into the company's DNA relatives feature, exposing names, relationships, DNA percentage shared, and ancestry reports. An additional 1.4 million people had family tree information accessed. All right. All right. Um, oh, hey, Legrat actually pointing out something, uh, indicating my, you know, ignorance. Um, Britain is not in the EU anymore because of Brexit, right? So pip pip cheerio does not apply to this story because they are not in the EU. I should be saying viva la cyber. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lagrat. I appreciate that. Okay. So 23andMe, 23andMe got hacked recently through a credential stuffing attack. Um, not to like pile on to 23andMe, but they did not require their end users. Again, Really quickly, like the story is what the story is, right? So hackers got in and they stole a bunch of data and more information's coming out about what kind of data they got. Okay, so 23andMe, the damage is done. People are probably like numb to this. Okay, here is the bigger picture, okay? The bigger picture, in my opinion, is that this is a perfect example of a tech company not requiring multi-factor authentication, allowing end users to have to just terrible, terrible passwords. Um, you can't prevent end users from reusing passwords because 23andMe isn't going to know that I use the same password on LinkedIn and Bank of America and all these other things. So they can't do anything about that. But if they had multi-factor, they could have. Dude, 6.9 million users. I it, It's almost unfathomable to wrap my head around the fact that 6.9 million people who use 23andMe we're reusing credentials. It, <coughs> excuse me. It just goes to show that so many people, so many people reuse passwords all the time. Get on a password manager, get on a password vault. Do yourself a favor, do your end users a favor. Run a, a session, run a workshop on setting up a password vault for your end users. Make a video, show them. I feel like with password vaults, it's so like getting on board a password vault is the major hurdle. Once you have it, you're like, oh my God, how did I live without this before? But when you don't have it, 
getting on seems overwhelming and very intimidating, especially if you're not a tech person. So, um, you know, I guess help people get on that. Um, I will be interested. The type of data that got out uh, included a little bit of PII, but also a ton of ancestry data. So Luke Canfield and I are related, like, you know, three cousins removed. Um, now the threat actors know that, you know, Jerry and Luke Canfield are related. I don't know how you exploit that information. This is really, this is really like interesting data, but I personally, short of like, you know, your basic obvious phishing, social engineering, pretexting as like a long lost relative and you want to get some money. Um, I don't see how you weaponize this in a innovative novel way. Okay. I, I would say that this is probably an interesting uh, way to update the Nigerian 419 scam where you could say, oh, I'm I, not only am I a Nigerian prince or a Nigerian astronaut who's been stuck on a Rus Russian space station for years, but uh, I'm a uh, Nigerian prince who's also related to your cousin Eddie, you know, through a marriage of, you know, Tom and, and Tom, uh, or Tom and Sally, whose son was Eddie or whatever. Right. So like you can, you can increase the level of, um, legitimacy to your pretexts, to your social engineers and maybe weaponize it that way. But you know, uh, okay. Like th that's that. I feel like this is more of an interesting story because it's DNA and it, you can't change your DNA and stuff like that. Not a good look for 23 and me, but I don't know. Again, I'm not, I'm more of a conformist. That's why I suck at red team stuff, but, uh, I'll be interested to see how red teamers and threat actors come out, uh, come up with innovative ways to do this. Let's look at 23 and me's stock really quickly. Um, I'll give you one guess when the data breach popped <laughs> right here, trading at $2 down to $1. So their stock took a 50% hit. Um, this is not financial advice at all. Normally I would say after a breach, it's usually three to three months or so. And then it rebounds because people forget they have short memories, but 23 and me has been sliding downward since January. Right? So this is not a healthy, this is not a healthy, um, trend line. So the data breach had nothing to do with this except exasperating it a bit more. So, um, to me, I'm just going to leave this here again. This isn't financial advice. I, I literally suck at, um, financials and stuff. Ask me on uh, jawjacking or 23 and me about my, my brilliant investment strategies. When I ran, uh, when I ran my own, uh, situation, a uh, spoiler alert, I put $2,500 in and instantly lost it instantly. You'll you'll crack up when you hear what I did and why I lost it instantly. And by instantly, I mean within like, I don't know, like a week. Eufy Flaw opens the door to boot kits. Security researchers at Binarly detailed logo fail, a vulnerability in Eufy firmware that allows for hijacking image libraries to bypass boot validation systems. This impacts image parsing libraries across firmware from AMI, Inside, Phoenix, Intel, Acer, and Lenovo, allowing malicious image files to load at boot. This process doesn't modify the bootloader or firmware components, making it harder to identify than something like the Black Lotus boot kit disclosed earlier this year. The researchers plan to release full technical findings at Black Hat Europe on December 6th. All right, so Black Hat Europe is happening tomorrow. Uh, the re this research is going to be dropped tomorrow. This is not academic research. This is security researcher research. It's dubbed logo fail. Let's hope for a uh, vulnerability logo. If you don't know me, I know Lintel, it's your first time today. Larry, it's your first time. I have an unhealthy uh, affinity for infographics and vulnerability logos. <laughs> and Jen Easterly. <laughs> just just kidding, Jen. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not weird. Okay, there we go, Jen. Um, so updating the uh, UEFI. So basically, just so you guys know, typically when a laptop or a computer boots up, it's got a BIOS, like a basic input oper uh, input output system. It's it's the thing that if you remove the operating system, your Windows, your Linux, whatever, it's the thing that boots the computer up. It's the black screen you see at the beginning. Um, 
And then that grabs your, your master boot record for your operating system and launches your operating system. And that's why you see the black screen and you can press the F12 or delete key because right now you're in the BIOS. And then once you get the Windows splash page, the, op the Windows operating system is loading. UEFI is, um, and again, I might do this a disservice, so please feel free to clarify. But UF UEFI is more of the modern BIOS. So you've got the BIOS itself. But then you have UEFI, which is kind of like the second BIOS, and there's more security, um, trust platform management, right? The TPM chip, um, BitLocker, like all the stuff that is like more advanced and secure, that's happening in the UEFI. And this is like a relatively, not new, but relatively new, right? Like last 10, 15 years. So... When they say UEFI flaw allows you to potentially bypass the secure solutions, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about kneecapping and nerfing UEFI, which is where a lot of the pre-operating system security happens, right? Like threat actors, they can attack applications. Really clever ones can get in and attack the operating system using like bring your own driver or, you know, Windows vulnerabilities and stuff like that. But if you're doing it at the BIOS level or UEFI level, mm, chef's kiss, it, you're all set because it doesn't matter. It's below the operating system. Uh, you can see here, they're talking about insecure BIOS image parsers. Um, so this will be interesting. Again, with UEFI bypass systems, the question starts to begin, to me, it begins to say, okay, like, how does this exploit happen? How successful is it, right? Because if you have to physically be at the system in order to implement this and reboot the computer, right? Well, then you're introducing, um, you, you know, a, a smaller likelihood because you got to physically be there. Um, you're going to alert the, uh, the victim that you've rebooted their computer unless you have creds to get on it in the first place. Um, maybe, maybe you can access it remotely. I don't know. I don't know enough about this, but the fact that they're releasing their findings at black hat tomorrow would indicate that there's going to be, um, either a proof of concept exploit or worse an exploit. The final thing I'll say is this is not trivial to patch. Okay. Ah, oh, you got to patch it. There will be a patch hopefully for this thing. Uh, Rex says, if I recall, UFI also allows some advanced in hardware tech, like higher capacity hard drives to be properly recognized. Absolutely. Um, so check it out. This is not trivial to patch because you're not patching Microsoft windows. You're patching your Dell BIOS or like, it's not even Dell, like whoever the BIOS or UEFI vendor is inside, right? So maybe it's Intel, maybe it's a hardware manufacturer like Dell. Uh, does it say in here um, who it is? Yeah, Intel, BootGuard, AMD, Hardware Validated Boot, right? So these are big names and they're pretty widespread. So if you were going to fix this, you would have to get an Intel or AMD patch and then apply it into the UEFI or into the BIOS, which means you'd have to boot into the BIOS system and then implement it. It's it's not trivial. It's not easy. Also for um, MSP people in here, I know uh, BSEC is on vacation, so he may not be here. But if you are a MSP or do IT operations, with Windows patching, you can use centralized management. You can do um, SCCM and stuff, and you can push patches to 1,000 endpoints, 10,000 endpoints, and have centrally managed it. With these type of patches, I don't know if you can do centralized management deployment. This may be a very difficult nut to crack, which is why you want to know how likely it is to be exploited and how uh, bad it is if, if it's exploited. By the way, spoiler alert, this looks really bad if exploited. Phony WordPress advisory includes a backdoor. If you're a website admin, it's usually a good idea to keep up on security advisories. However, researchers at WordFence and PatchStack published a report on a new threat campaign looking to take advantage of that behavior. Threat actors began sending a fake security advisory to WordPress admins claiming to offer data on CVE 2023-45123 and urging them to install a plugin to remediate the issue. Instead, this plugin creates a hidden admin user, sends site info to a C2 server, and then installs a backdoor payload. 
All right. Hey, really quickly, because there is a 20 second delay from like when I speak to when you guys hear me, um, just really quickly, I want to say super chat. Thanks, Rex. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Uh, I propose a new cyber principle. What would uh, WWGAD, what would Jerry Osier do? Thank you. Uh, again, James McQuiggan with the super chats. Thanks. Uh, I mean, just become best friends. not yep. super chats, but with the squad memberships. Yeah. Um, so owned in chat says uh, owned as an MSP drone and can't do the patches pushing for UEFI. I'm also seeing Josh Mason in chat saying that you can use Metasploit to reboot and use uh, GPO to push BIOS patching. And that BIOS patching isn't that hard. So uh, we've got conflicting reports here. Uh, definitely um, investigate your situation. This is like, I'll just point out, this may not be something that you lose your mind to, okay? This is going to make a lot of pub. But if you remember malware and Spectre, not malware, oh, freaking, uh, what was it? Spectre and, um, oh my God, what was the other one? Spectre and Meltdown. If you remember Spectre and Meltdown, everybody was like, oh my God, ah, ah, the sky's falling. Ah. And like, it wasn't really that bad. Okay. So just do your due diligence or stay with the channel. I'm sure there'll be future news stories that we cover about the patching, about the impact, about those type of things. So let's keep going. Uh, fake WordPress security advisory pushes backdoor plugin. Ugh. All right. So, hey, if you're thinking... You gotta patch it. Patch all the things. Be careful because bad guys realize that you will blindly grab a patch and push it. When you're doing patching and also educate your end users, <laughs> I would focus on your IT staff and your more you know power user IT people. Let them know that threat actors know that if you that you will patch because you want to stay secure and that they'll push malicious patches to you in order to get you to trick. Uh, to trick you into loading malware. Okay, so be careful of that. Uh, I say this every time a WordPress story comes up. WordPress, anyone can stand a WordPress up. Carl and his bake sale. Um, you know, Julie, uh, you know, like setting up like an earring business for the holidays, whatever. R&D, not wanting to go through proper IT channels because they just want to test out something with WordPress. Scan your network, look for WordPress sites, if you if they're authorized, make sure that people understand that uh, they should disable plugins they're not using and keep plugins they are using um, updated. If they're not approved, shut those suckers down. Shut it down. Go full John Taffer. Go full John Taffer and shut them down. Um, WordPress has notoriously been um, WordPress has notoriously been a uh, attack vector. So go full John Taffer. Come on, John. Oh my God, this is embarrassing. Shut it down. Oh my God. Can we please? Bro, there you go. Thanks, John. Full John Taffer and shut it down. If WordPress sites are not approved, you're literally introducing risk exposure for no reason other than you want to have your website. Guess what? Go spin up a WordPress on your own infrastructure. Not on my corporate infrastructure. Thank you. Come again. All right. We're right at 8.59. So let's do this. Guys, I want to thank all of you for being here. You guys are all amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. If you're one of the 450 people here, thank you. I want to remind everybody that um, later this week uh, on Thursday, we've got Mike Prevett coming on. But what I really want to tell you is that um, you may notice I'm wearing my Try Hack Me shirt today. Today is day five of Try Hack Me's advent of cyber. Um, I know there were some claims that Try Hack Me is um, a little scammy. I've got an investigation going in over to Try Hack Me. I've reached out to them yesterday. But until we get disposition on that, advent of cyber 2023 is happening. If you've been playing advent of cyber, you know what it is. If you do not know what it is, I'm going to drop a link in chat. Um, today is day five, and I have a video. So at 11 a.m. Eastern today, a video on Simply Cyber Channel is going to publish, and it's day five. It's a complete walkthrough of day five. If you're doing Advent of Cyber, please enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I take a lot of pride in, in the work I do, and I feel like I delivered a great experience 
to all the advent of cyber players out there. So, um, you know, thanks a lot and uh, be well. Uh, Valentino, let's talk bar rescue during jaw jacking. All right, guys, today is Tuesday, which means it is uh, Citadel Tuesday. But guess what, guys? Today is the official last day of the Citadel, and I am doing a Zoom class uh, for the students because I'm basically doing a final exam review. And starting, uh, well, after today, I don't, Monday through Friday is going to be the same every single Monday through Friday until the spring semester starts. So we made it to the end of the fall semester. Congratulations to all of you and, and to my Citadel cadets. They all did wonderful this year. Uh, Lacey Cochran, uh, yesterday there were people in chat saying that Advent of Cyber Try Hack Me did not provide the prizes to people who won prizes last year. Um, again, I'm not uh, jumping to conclusions. I've taken the input from those people. I've expressed uh, the concern to Try Hack Me and asked them for a response. We're getting down to it. Uh, but Try Hack Me, uh, Advent of Cyber is a lot of fun. All right, guys, let's pivot over to jaw jacking. Uh, if you're interested, otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time for the Simply Cyber, Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Thanks so much. Be well, and let's jaw jack for 10 minutes. Oh, wait, hold on. Whoops. <laughs> Let me do the transition. Transition, computer. All right, guys, what's up? Welcome to Jaw Jack. And you guys got to see how the sausage was made there as I made a mistake, which happens all the time. I'm human. Surprise, I'm not AI. <laughs> uh, welcome to Jaw Jack. And I am your host, Jerry Guy, just kicking it. We got lo fi holiday session on the big screen back there. Just kicking it. I'll spend about 10 minutes, then I've got to hit a bio break and then. Um, Get my Citadel students uh, sorted out for the end of the semester. Woo! All right, guys. All right, let's talk. Uh, Valentino, gotta run. Okay, Justin Gold, be good, my man. Uh, hey, guys, if um, if any of you are newcomers, first-timers, and I missed it in chat. Welcome to the party, pal. Thank you. Hey, man, McDaniel, coffee cup, cheers. I've been getting up at 6 a.m., and... Uh, I go hard right into the coffee, so it's been very difficult. I try to keep one cup of coffee for the stream, for the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, but it's hard, y'all. Uh, hey, really quickly, Valentino mentioned uh, that Bar Rescue is Valentino's dirty pleasure. I got to tell you, Valentino, and all those who are John Taffer fans, I was huge, huge on uh, Bar Rescue. I loved it. But um, there was one episode that was like so ridiculous, so unbelievably ridiculous that I started looking into it and I shouldn't have looked into it. And unfortunately, it's completely manufactured, like a big surprise. It's completely manufactured. Um, like the staff at the bar is told to act ridiculous. They're like, they know that John Taffer's coming in. They, they intentionally hype up how dumb they are and, the drama, and then John Taffer over embellishes his response. And then a lot of the businesses, um, you know, are, it, it, the whole thing is manufactured and it sucks because I wanted it so bad to be real. I love John Taffer's over the top absurdity. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I'm out. I, I'm out on bar rescue only for that reason. I, I, I'm like a, a shark tank. And for those reasons, John Taffer, I'm out. All right. So if you got any questions, drop them in chat. I've got five more minutes to hang out. Lou AI says, I'm a newcomer and just want to start getting an understanding on what certs are the best for entry level, such as compliance. All right. So um, there aren't really a lot of compliance certs. Um, if you're interested in compliance, um, look up GRC stuff. There are some GRC related certifications, but not really. Lou AI the, the best one I, I guess I could recommend is the ISACA CISA, ISACA CISA, because um, that's basically auditing for compliance. So there's love, uh, there's value there. 
Shadow Crab asks if I've played the password game. I don't know what that means, so no. Oh my God! You know what? A hundred percent. Um, Jenny, how, uh, who, who just dropped this in chat? Kimberly, Kimberly McKnight. I'm not going to lie. Tabitha Salon Takeover. This was at the height of Bar Rescue. I was into Tabitha Salon Takeover. I will admit it. I was totally into Tabitha Salon Takeover. In fact, I actually liked it more than Bar Rescue because I thought she was more authentic uh, and less over the top. Um, but yeah. Good call. That's it. You want to talk about a deep cut? Tab of the salon takeover. Deep cut. Nice job, Kimberly. Uh, I don't know what the password game is, by the way. So uh, during the strike, they were mentioning this. Okay. Um, Eddie says the GRC masterclass. Yeah, exactly. Luke AI, if you're interested. Um, I mean, not Luke. Um, what was it? What was, who was the person that asked the question? It was some Lou AI, Lou AI. If you want, um, you can do, uh, this, All right? Again, I don't try to, I don't try to like pimp my own courses because I feel kind of weird doing that. But my GRC course is a good way to learn GRC and compliance. Um, all right. I'm getting information about the password game. It looks like it's a it's a game that's a browser based. We could play it online. I do want to do um, I do want to do like more game stuff on Simply Cyber Cafe. So, Josh Mason, don't don't rain on my parade. Josh Mason's chirping in that all the shows are fully scripted. Wham wham. Catch me outside. How about that? Uh, Chris Young with a question. Doctor Osher, is GRC compliance and auditing an active daily role or more of an intermittent job? Uh, of a third party guest auditor, like coming in to CSF Arma. Okay. Uh, so compliance and auditing is, it can be an active role, right? So audits typically take, depending on the size of the organization and, and what you're doing, you could do like three months for an audit, right? Then there's, you know, that would be like planning, auditing, execution. If you have multiple sites, maybe you have like rotate, like you're going to go audit this site, then audit this site, then audit this site. Um, with, Typically with like GRC compliance auditors, if that's like your job, you're typically the person who's getting the requests from third party entities to fill out questionnaires around your compliance with security standards. You're also the one documenting what your security uh, system security plan looks like. So it's more than just the active activity of auditing. It's also educating end users on what compliance looks like. It's, it's getting those compliance standards and making them available. It's working with vulnerability management or doing the vulnerability management scanning to scan and uh, validate what your standards are. So it's a full-time job. What is the easiest pen test to get into? I only looked into web app and API. Ooh, good question, VQ Saint. Um, I'm not really, uh, I'll tell you what VQ Saint, I can't answer that because I haven't done pen testing professionally I would think web app only because you can do, uh, and your, your question of what is the easiest, that's an incredibly subjective way to ask the question. So it can be answered many different ways. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade by it being subjective. I'm just qualifying my answer by saying a lot of people can answer it differently because the way they interpret your question is different. But to me, the easiest pen test to get into would be web app bug bounty because you can get into it today. You can go on Hacker One and register an account today, get on web apps and start hacking them. So you would be a pen tester today and you could add it to your resume as an active role. Uh, Josh Mason, who does have red team uh, offsec experience is chiming in and says web app is the easiest yeah. Oh, so Josh is saying what I just said. Yep. Go to Bug Crowd, go to Hacker One, sign up, and you're off and running. Okay. You're welcome, Chris Young. Um, all right. Hey, it's 9:10. I got a bio break. I got to do a couple things for the Citadel before we get into it. Um be good, everybody. Enjoy. Please, I'm wearing the Advent of Cyber shirt today because I'm hoping that a lot of people enjoy um my, my day five, uh, class, uh, just to give you guys some teasers, the day five is, uh, basically reverse engineering and working inside of a uh, legacy operating system. I know a lot of you think I'm just a GRC nerd who just has a clipboard and, uh, hold on one second. 
Let me get my full GRC outfit on. Let me get my full GRC outfit on. There we go. Hello, I'm here to audit the water pressure. Yeah, please, please uh, look at my checklist. Okay, I know that's what many of you think I do all the time, <laughs> but I do have some technical acumen and uh, I will be doing uh, some reverse engineering, working with some magic bites and getting into an old school operating system and dinking around with that. So uh, enjoy it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I couldn't premiere it as I couldn't do a premiere so we could chat during it. So if you guys want to holler at it at me in um, Discord, we could do that or drop drop comments in chat. It will be on YouTube only. It'll be on YouTube only on the Simply Cyber channel. Um, I know like 99% of you are already subscribed to my YouTube channel, but uh, this is it right here. And uh, hold on one second. Oh my God, bro. It's my other YouTube channel. Here's the YouTube channel. If you want... Um, if you want to get the uh, advent of cyber the second it drops, that's the YouTube channel right there. YouTube.com slash at simply cyber. Again, you're literally listening to me right now on that channel. So hit the subscribe button if you want to be made aware uh, or hit the subscribe and notify. Um, oh, okay. Hey, really, really quick before I go, Chris Young reminded me about the $2,500 fool's errand I did. Okay, so guys, I don't really understand. Uh, I'm good at technology and computer science and stuff. I'm terrible at financials. Um, you know, when I was, uh, you know, younger, I had a couple bucks, finally some disposable income. I'm going to do some investments. Um, yeah, hey, Jenny Housley, I will be streaming on SC Cafe later today. So good call. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to do some cool stuff, uh, lo fi music, I've been doing. Uh, music to study and work to on Simply Cyber Cafe, which is my other YouTube channel. If you'd like to support the channel, still only 385 subs on there. Um, so you can be an early adopter. Go over there and check it out. Thanks, Jenny Housley. I'll schedule that to run after the Citadel uh, thing later today. But I've been doing lo-fi music if you're interested in that. Um, all right, final, final. Okay, the year is 2008. Okay, maybe maybe some of you already see where this is going. The year is 2008. Jerry, speaking in the third person, finally has a little bit of disposable income and I put $2500 into like an E-Trade account or Fidelity or whatever, one of these one of these like retail investor accounts. I'm watching CNBC. I'm reading blog posts. I'm, I'm like, oh my God, everything's so crazy. I take $2,500 and I put it into Fannie Mae. Now, Fannie Mae is, it was like a massive mortgage company. If you weren't around in 2008, there's this thing called the subprime mortgage crisis and it, our economy almost fully imploded in 2008, okay? So I literally took my money and put it in what is arguably the most volatile thing. And in my mind, I was like, there's no way the government's going to let Fannie Mae fail. So I put my money in Fannie Mae. This is a true story, okay? If I could go back and find the day to show the uh, the bar chart thing. I, so I put my money in Fannie Mae and I leave, I leave work. So I'm doing this at work too, okay? <laughs> I leave work and I drive home and I'm listening to business radio and the stock market closes, I think, at 4 o'clock. And at 4.01, they announced that Fannie Mae is, like, imploding. And I'm like, what the hell? So it, it was trading at, like, I don't know, $5 a share. or Yeah, I think it was, like, 5 bucks a share or something. And they're like, oh, it's going down. It keeps dropping, keeps dropping. It's $2. It's $1. And I, I'm, like, racing home. And I, like, fire up my laptop. And I'm trying to trade. And it's, like, down to $1. And I'm trying to trade. And I can't because the markets are closed. But I'm like, how is it going down if the markets are closed? Here's something else I didn't know about. People like me don't get to trade after four o'clock, but people who work in the business and understand money and all these other things, somehow they get to trade after hours. So 
I put the money in and then literally just watched it implode. I think it went down to like, I don't know, like 50 cents or something. And when the stock opened the next day, I had like 300 bucks or something like that. I remember I cashed out with like two, 300 bucks. And I was like, all right, I got it. I don't know what I'm doing. Time to uh, employ somebody who does know what they're doing to manage my finances. That was a fun lesson. I basically chalked it up as I spent $2,500 or $2,200 to get a free, le- uh, to get a lesson in financial management and how not to invest. So be careful. There you go. That's what happens uh, when you're a donkey. So uh, learn from me. Learn from me. All right, guys, I really got to get out of here. Be well to each other. I'll see you at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Please enjoy the advent of Cyber at 11 a.m. Do me a favor, comment on the post, share it on socials. I'd love to get as many people out there learning about Simply Cyber so secretly they can come join the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing and we can continue to build our network and just straight up crush things. I'm Jerry, your chat. Until next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's live.